Hello and welcome to another BC Serious Chat. So this one today is a little bit different, probably more in the style of a podcast. Um, but if you are not familiar with the BC uh, Serious Chats, um, I just want to give a recap on um, some of the topics that we've already covered. Um, the first one was how do I determine value? Um, so I talked a little bit about um, determining value and the factors that go into determining the worth of something. Uh, I talked about vi how vintage trumpets, I feel, are a better, a hands down, a better buy than a modern instrument. Um, we looked at, uh, do I leave my trumpet stock or do I look at modifying it? And the last couple, it was actually a two-part series. Um, I did two because um, the first one, the focus was out. Um, but actually, uh, the second one adds uh, even more detail than the first. Um, around uh, 2019 being a great time to pick up that Martin uh, Committee B-flat trumpet. And the reasons why in terms of prices. And I give um, some statistics, well, some actual factual information in that video um, based on market um, prices. So you have before us today the uh, illustrious, uh, I'm going to call this the Iron Chops chest set. Um, and there's a reason for uh, having this uh, chest set. It's not just because uh, it's a cold and wet day and I feel like uh, breaking out some chess. Um, but I wanted to uh, talk about a couple of things. Um, there's a reason, obviously, for the pieces being on the board. Um, and also, uh, I want to tie into the fact about strategy. Now, the topic um, around today um, is to, a little bit to do with, I guess, uh, finance and a little bit to do with um, motivation towards why someone would purchase uh, brass instruments or accessories. Um, so the primary reason, obviously, for most people would be purely function. They're purchasing a brass mouthpiece in this case let's talk about mouthpieces purely for the functional piece um, and that is um, obviously I purchase a mouthpiece because I want it to perform in a certain way um, which is fine uh, another reason that you might get into um, collecting or purchasing vintage mouthpieces obviously as some form of uh, one function and two as some kind of alternative collectible, um, which is another option. Um, and if you look at the board before you today, um, I have a pretty good representation um, of vintage mouthpieces um, that have, in some cases, uh, some pretty high values. Um, if I looked at the average uh, cost on the board, we're probably looking at least uh, 70 between 70 and 100 US dollars, um, with the exception of uh, these ones right here, um, which are just uh, cup and backboards, but even those are vintage uh, pieces. Um, yeah, so obviously with that amount of cost, like if you look at the uh, total value of the board, um, we're somewhere uh, in the vicinity of close to 3,000 US dollars for the pieces that you see before you. Um, and uh, they represent quite a few years of me either specifically targeting or accumulating um, certain mouthpieces. Um, and there's a reason that I have targeted certain mouthpieces. So um, allow me to break these down. So uh, the reason that I get into uh, or got into vintage mouthpieces was I wanted to originally experiment um, with the functionality. Um, and then I cottoned on to the fact that, hey, these might actually be a viable collectible for the future. Now, the purpose wasn't necessarily to make money um, in that case. It was more about I want to preserve some of the stories um, and keep some great examples both for myself and for other people if they play instruments um, and or to match with certain um, uh, mouthpiece, mouthpiece receivers. Um, so that's kind of why I got um, into it um, the way that I did. Um, and uh, I ended up uh, amassing 
the collection that you see before you, and plus I obviously have others. Um, and I wanted to explain, um, I guess, a couple of reasons why I targeted uh, some of the mouthpieces that I did. Um, now you'll see that I'm using, um, I don't know if this is going to focus, but I'm using the L Cass uh, brand mouthpieces for the Kings. I think those uh, mouthpieces are some of the best um, mouthpieces uh, available. One for functionality and two for collectability. Um, it's interesting that those uh, particular mouthpieces were actually in higher demand um, during the years 2006 to about 2008. Um, yeah, right up to actually ba basically before the financial crash. Um, they were in high demand um, and Interestingly, the supply was actually at its peak at that point in time. Um, the reason being um, the, the demand was created by actually Steve Cass uh, himself, son of El Cass. He was selling off the majority of the collection um, that uh, he had been passed on. And that included a bunch of originals and also uh, single boxes of uh, milk pieces um, that were um, in the... Uh, still in the uh, mouthpieces, new old stock mouthpieces still in the box. Um, and he even went to sell on some of the original master set, which was used in the uh, photography. Um, and at that time, uh, even myself, I uh, took the opportunity and I purchased close to uh, 30 uh, mouthpieces at that time, um, of uh, s since of which I have... Uh, basically uh, sold most of those and I've had to rebuy um, a number of uh, different mouthpieces. LCAS mouthpieces, uh, the the pieces that are hugely in demand, uh, basically the 128 is always in demand, um, but interestingly the value has fallen off slightly. Um, at its peak, uh, the the 128 uh, was selling between 250 and 350 US dollars. Um, you can probably get that same mouthpiece um, at the lower end uh, these days, if not a little bit less. Um, the ones that were really selling for big money at that time were the 3 by 5 uh, mouthpieces. Um, and secondly, the 3 by 4 which is, this is a 3 by 4 right here. Um, they were selling for big money. Um, I was seeing them selling for uh, 500 US dollars, between 500 and a thousand US dollars for a three by five mouthpieces. Um, the reason being that um, they are regard highly regarded as a fantastic uh, lead uh, trumpet mouthpiece. Um, they have a lot of support and a nice cushion rim, which a lot of people find really comfortable. Um, so the 128s and the three by fives were by far the most collectible uh, mouthpieces um, at that time. Uh, these days, uh, 3x5s have definitely come down in price. Um, the 2 Series are probably the, the least um, popular, which is kind of interesting because Dizzy Gillespie pay, played a 2x24 uh, and a 2x25. Um, I've actually got uh, one of his um, backup mouthpieces. Um, it's an interesting one. Um, the back ball was slightly different. It was uh, the A back ball, which was a slight zip on it. Um, it gave you a, a bit more sparkle. Um, and the one I should have never sold is the 4 Series. I had a 4-1 uh, trumpet mouthpiece original in silver plate, and I foolishly sold that. Um, and it took me uh, 10 years to find a replacement, and even the replacement I found is not the B-flat version, it is the C-trumpet version, um, which is not very well known, but they actually made a C-shank um, as well as a B-flat shank. So. That's all about um, LKS mouthpieces, um, still highly collectible, um, there are reproductions available, um, they're pretty faithful reproductions, I believe uh, Steve actually put some out himself, um, and I think they might have been done by Jim New, um, but I could be incorrect on that. Um, and just be careful with uh, when purchasing them, always look for pieces with the original script um, on the base. Um, and double check it against a well-known source. Um, Steve Cass actually got quite good at copying his father's uh, signature uh, script. 
um, and they look very, very close. Um, those are not, uh, those are originals um, too, but um, obviously not as highly desired as the original script from the man himself. Um, those ones would have represented some that had um, come out of new old stock boxes and then been signed off. Um, I have a couple of examples of those. So uh, that's all about Alcast math pieces. Um, now I'm using uh, for the knights, um, I am using um, what I think are the blue chip um, style and uh, I'm using for representing the knights because I think these are the reliable, slow and steady um, mouthpiece of the kind of an, you know alternate investment and that is the Bach New York mouthpieces. So uh, they have the, um, you can check the uh, Bach Loyalist website um, for all the details on that, but basically 1930s mouthpieces, uh, they tended to be a little bit flatter and a little bit deeper um, than the modern counterparts. They were very, very well made um, and they're highly regarded today. Obviously the, um, the most sought after pieces are between the Bark 1 and the Bark 3 size. So you got 1, 1 1.25, 1 and a quarter, oh sorry, 1, 1 and a quarter, 1.5, um, the 2, 2 and a half, 2 and 3 quarters, and the 3 are probably um, the ones, obviously with the 1 and the 1.5, and the 3 um, being the most popular. The 3 is the most popular because of, uh, obviously, Chris Bodie playing a 3, um, kind of drove the demand on those. Um, and then, obviously, orchestral players are playing in the uh, 1 to 2 range, um, and, and you know the, the uh, some of the top orchestras that drives the demand of those mouthpieces. Um, you know it's widely regarded that uh, that those mouthpieces are very hard to copy or reproduce. Um, so people basically gravitate towards the originals, um, and you're seeing a massive price jump um, across the board on New York Bach mouthpieces currently. Um, even the sevens and the ten and a halfs. The ten and a halfs are probably the most common um, size in the uh, Bach New Yorks. And I say that, um, you know, having said that, it's probably going to drive my own values down, but I collect um, sizes that I use. Um, and they're basically from a seven uh, through to a ten and a half is, is uh, what I typically collect. I would love to have a, a one and three range, but I'm not going to fork out between three and five hundred US dollars for a mouthpiece, um, unless I actually get it, have it in my hand in front of me, um, which is a little bit uh, hard to do these days. So, uh, yeah, the other size that's quite popular is the 17 C1 and the 17 C2, and it's to do with the association with uh, Clifford Brown. Um, he played on a 17 C1 or C2 um, during his career probably a cornet and then switching to a um, uh, to a trumpet, um, which is kind of strange because it's quite a small mouthpiece and he had quite large lips. Um, so it kind of bucked the conventional thinking. Um, so they're still on demand today. Um, as I say, the 10 and a half is probably the uh, most common. Um, sevens, they're still uh, readily available. Um, yeah, I've seen very few kind of in the five to six range um, and I personally collect kind of like the, but I basically get the eights and the nines and the tens. Um, so this example here is a, uh, 10 B. Um, I, I really like the B cups. Um, and I believe I have over here, no here, um, a seven B. I really like the B cups. The B cups are, uh, quite deep, quite wide and, and very comfortable. And they give you a nice full tone. So you can go with a, a slightly smaller cup than you would typically. So that's kind of uh, the vintage bark uh, mouthpieces. I think they're kind of like the little blue chips. They will continue to uh, retain their, I believe, uh, they will continue to retain their value for many, many years to come. Um, now I've got uh, Martin, um, Martin mouthpieces on here. I forgot whose turn it is. One, two, three. Uh, yeah, it must be White's turn. Um, I have uh, Martin mouthpieces purely for the fact, obviously, uh, I deal with a lot of um, 
uh, Martin instruments and I keep those basically for players and to match um, instruments with their correct receivers, um, etc. Um, and that's the reason uh, I have those. Um, is, is basically for that reason. Uh, they are kind of uh, accumulating slowly um, and, and that would be very, very slowly. Um, now I'm using, uh, for the Queens today, I've got the, uh, basically the 1930s uh, Handcraft Standard, um, maybe even the Imperial, um, but I think this is the Handcraft Standard um, model. Uh, they are slightly more popular um, today than they were um, a few years ago. Um, that's because another seller is using these for demos um, and is creating a small, very, very small demand. Um, but they have increased in value, whereas you would have picked these up for maybe $30. Um, earlier, you're probably looking at uh, you know, $90 to $100 today for for a good example of one of these mouth pieces, maybe even more. Um, so they've certainly gone up. Um, the Handcraft uh, Imperial designs, uh, these ones here, um, have uh, slowly increased, but not significantly. Um, when I was first, first buying these, I might have bought them for, you know, between 20 and uh, I think maybe 50 is the, the most I've ever paid for one. Um, today, they would probably um, be selling uh, easily um, around the 70 to $85 mark, um, if not a little bit more. Now certainly if you're in, uh, depends which kitchen you're in, if you were um, purchasing that um, mouthpiece in Japan, you'd pay a significant premium, um, especially Alcas mouthpieces, they tend to sell for 28,000 yen, um, right up to 50,000 yen, so 280 to 500 US dollars, um, just because of location. So um, there's a reason behind that. Uh, so yeah, so I've collected these uh, basically for uh, the purpose uh, for testing instruments, um, but also uh, I think they're a solid mouthpiece. Um, the eights um, probably being, well basically the eights and nines, uh, forget about the tens, the tens are too shallow to be practically usable by most people. Um, so the eights and nines are where it's at in terms of those pieces. Uh, other pieces you see in front of you here, um, we have, um, so we've talked about Martin. Uh, the pawns I'm using uh, today, uh, these are Con Constellation uh, Cornet mouthpieces. Um, these are just a beautiful designed mouthpiece that were specific to a, an era. Um, I purchased these as a lot. Um, it's basically a dealer's kit. Um, Supposedly came from Byron himself as a gift to the person I purchased these off. Um, this was an eBay purchase. I bought um, the eight pieces that you see um, as the pawns. Uh, plus, uh, they came in the original presentation case with Constellation on the back. Um, I thought it was a nice little package. Um, I got them for a reasonable price. They are in this kind of condition, obviously. You know, the thing with any, um, if you're buying for an investment, um, the thing is you need to get in at the right price. I think I got a great deal on these because um, I purchased the whole lot. I would have liked to have had more, um, but that's all that was available. Um, I per I've had these in the past that, that I purchased um, and I sold them uh, for double what I paid for them um, and I can easily double my money on what I paid for these as well. Um, should I choose to sell them? They're great. Well, actually they are for sale um, on the website. Um, and uh, yeah, just a great price. They're brand new, um, have not been played, the new old stock essentially. Um, now on this side, we've got um, the Holton Himes. Uh, again, I think these are a great uh, piece, original because of the association with Heim and, and kind of Miles Davis, um, having that kind of flat, uh, deep V kind of setup. Um, I got this one plus the uh, trumpet shank that goes with it. Um, unfortunately, uh, I didn't get the screw rim that goes with the trumpet shank, so I've kind of got one uh, unusable. Um, or if it does, no, that's not a screw off. Um, 
uh, one unusable piece. Um, the other side uh, I talked about this one is uh, the Alolan personal model um, that was made by Schilke in the 1930s. Um, and these are very fragile. I can see this is starting to crack actually. Um, I purchased those as a big set, five all at once. Um, got a great deal on those. Um, and I think those and those are the kind of pieces that very little uh, people know about. And obviously through education, um, they start to become a little bit more in demand. Um, and then we've got on the, the uh, table here, um, using his knights on the uh, white side, um, the Schilke uh, Lasky uh, mouthpieces. These are the newest ones on the table, probably made in the late, uh, probably made in the mid uh, 90s to early 2000s, at a guess, um, based on the career of the person I purchased those off. Um, and then the uh, wild cards on the table here are these, uh, the pawns, which are the, the um, these are Frank Holton uh, Heim model uh, mouthpieces. I bought the bottom pieces. Um, without the rims, uh, it was a bulk deal. They were very cheap. They were under $10 a piece. Um, and I was uh, going to use them either as a piece of artwork. Um, I had visions of um, encasing those in acrylic and making some really cool paperweights. Um, or I could have um, obviously have someone do the custom rim um, and you know basically make a uh, heritage series out of those. Um, I'm still thinking about which direction I'm going to go. Uh, I think obviously if there was a demand again for those Holton Himes, um, I would seriously consider doing the heritage um, models. And it's certainly something that's um, an option in the future. Maybe is, um, you know, maybe I could go with an acrylic uh, top even, um, just to make it super interesting. Uh, but those are kind of the reasons uh, why I have uh, the particular mouthpieces that I have. Um, yeah, they represent um, several years of collecting. Uh, so the thing is about when you're buying uh, when you're buying these accessories um, to you know collect and maybe as a little bit of an alternative investment and have functionality you need to be you need a couple of things you need to be strategic about what you're doing there needs to be a purpose behind it uh, and my purpose is uh, not solely to make money um, that's an added bonus um, but if you're in it to make money um, and if you're in it for the quick buck uh, you are probably going to lose money and you're probably going to sit on a bunch of stock. Um, just talking about that, uh, mouthpieces are actually traditionally really hard for me to sell um, as a as a brass selling person. Um, over the last ten years, probably the one of the most difficult products to sell because people need to play them. Um, so that means you need to have a. I always sell them uh, when I have somebody um, that tests them out in person. Um, and I can kind of match them. I, I don't always sell them to people, but you know, maybe four out of ten will will purchase a a, a, a mouthpiece um, to go along with their vintage instrument. Um, and those are those are fairly decent odds, um, but they're really hard to sell unless you have a specific piece that's obviously in demand, like an LKS one twenty eight. People know exactly what to expect, um, or you know a a bark 1.5 people know exactly what to expect um, but even then um, it's not a, a slam dunk in terms of it being a guaranteed um, sale so they are traditionally quite hard to sell be prepared to sit on them for a long time you see a lot of people selling large collections of these pieces because they've accumulated them over the years um, and then they think they can sell them off all at once it's never the case um, you're lucky if you sell 30 percent of your collection per time um, so be very careful about um, how and when you put um, money into these with the express goal of you know trying to make money from it because it's just not going to work um, so you need to be super careful about that So that's um, all I really uh, wanted to say um, I hope you uh, enjoyed learning a little bit about some of these brands. Um, 
and uh, the format, uh, the format's a little bit different. Obviously, there's none of my face on it, which probably most people will appreciate. Um, a bit more of a podcast style um, and just sharing some basic information about some vintage mouthpieces. Do you have any questions? Um, do you collect um, vintage mouthpieces? And if so, which brands? And uh, what do you think the future prospects are for some of these? Um, is there maybe a new mouthpiece brand that you think um, has potential long-term uh, value. Um, yeah, let me know what you think. I'd be really interested to hear people's opinions. And again, I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, I look forward to uh, bringing you more content uh, very soon. So I'll see you in the next video.